The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 1, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Prince Jimu Founds Japan's Capital, B.C. 660. Sir Edward Reed, the Nihongi. Prince Jimu is the founder of the Empire of Japan, according to Japanese tradition. The whole of his history is overlaid with myth and legend, but it points to the immigration of Western Asiatics by way of Korea into the Japanese islands of Izumo and Kyushu. The historical records of the Japanese relate that Jimu, accompanied by an elder brother, Prince Itsuze, started from their grandfather's palace on Mount Takaklicho. They marched with a large number of followers, a horde of men, women, and children, as well as a band of armed men. On landing in Japan, after many years wandering by sea and land, they had serious conflicts with the native tribes. They eventually succeeded in overcoming all opposition and in conquering the country, so that Prince Jimu was enabled to build a palace and set up a capital, Kashihabara in Yamoto. This prince is regarded by Japanese historians as the founder of the Japanese Empire. He is said to have reigned 75 years after his accession, and to have died at the age of 127 years, and his burial place is pointed out in the northern side of Mount Unebi, in the province of Yamato. Prince Jimmu, or whoever was the foreign ruler who conquered and founded an empire in Japan, must have been a bold, enterprising, and sagacious man. The islands he subdued were barbarous, and he civilized them. The inhabitants were warlike and cruel, and he kept them in peace. He founded a dynasty which extended its dominion over Nagato, Izumo, and Owari, and still has representatives in rulers whose people are by far the most progressive dwellers in the East. That part of the following historical matter, which is translated from the old Japanese chronicle, the Nihongi, is marked by local color and by oriental characteristics, whereby it curiously contrasts with the plain recitals of modern and western history. Sir Edward Reed There are endless varying legends about this god period of Japan. All that we need now say in way of reciting the legends of the gods has relation to the descent of the Mikados of Japan from the deities. It was the misconduct of Suzano that drove the sun goddess into the cave and for this misconduct she was banished. Some say that instead of proceeding to his place of banishment, he descended and with his son Idakizo no Mikoto upon Shiraga in Korea, and not liking the place, went back by vessel to the bank of the Inokawa River in Izumo, Japan. At the time of their descent, Idakizo had many plants or seeds of trees with him, but he planted none in Shiraga, but took them across with him, and scattered them from Kuishu all over Japan, so that the whole country became green with trees. It is said that Itakiso is respected as the god of merit, and is worshipped in Kinokuni. His two sisters also took care of the plantation. One of the gods who reigned over the country in the prehistoric period was Ohonamuchi, who is said by some to be the son of Suzano, and by others to be one of his later descendants. And which is right, it is more than we can say remarked one of my scholarly friends. However, during his reign, he was anxious about the people, and consulting with Sukuna no Mikoto, applied his whole heart, we are told, to their good government, and they all became loyal to him. One time he said to his friends, just named, Do you think we are governing the people well? And his friend answered, In some respects well, and in some not. So that they were frank and honest with each other in those days. When Sukuna Nikono went away, Ohonamuchi said, It is I who should govern this country. Is there any who will assist me? Then there appeared over the sea a divine light, and there came a god floating and floating and said, You cannot govern the country without me. And this proved to be the god Ohomiwa no Kami, who built the palace in Mimuro in Yamoto and dwelt therein. He affords a direct link to the Mikado family, for his daughter became the empress of the first historic Jimu. Her name was Umetatara Isuzuhimi. All the descendants of her father are named like him, Ohomiwa no Kami, and it is said that the present empress of Japan is probably a descendant of this god. As regards the descent of the emperor Jimu himself, 
we already know that Nihingi no Mikoto, the sovereign grandchild of the sun goddess, was sent down with the sacred symbols of empire given to him in the sun by the sun goddess herself before he started for the earth. Now Nihingi married. Reader, forgive me for quoting the lady's name and for her father's. Konohane no Sakuyahime, Oho Yamazumi no Kami, and their pair had three sons, of whom the last, named Howoro no Mikoto, succeeded to the throne. He is sometimes called by the following simple and possibly endearing name. Amatsu Hitakahi Kohodemi no Mikoto. He married Toya Tamihime, the daughter of the sea god, and they had a son, Ogayafuki Aidesu no Mikoto. Born, it is said, under an unfinished roof of Komarin's wings, who succeeded the father and who married Tamayori Hime, also a daughter of the sea god. This illustrious couple had four sons, of whom the last succeeded to the throne in the year B.C. 660. He was named Kamuyamatoi Warehiko no Mikoto, but posterity has fortunately simplified his designation to the now familiar Jimu Tenno the first historic emperor of Japan, and the ancestor of the present emperor. The histories of Japan, prepared under the sanction of the present Japanese government, date to the commencement of the historic period from the first year of the reign of the first emperor, Jimu Tenno, who is said to have ruled for 76 years, viz. from B.C. 660 to 585. Some persons consider that his reign, and a few reigns that succeeded it, probably, or possibly, belong to the legendary period, because while on the one hand the emperor Jimmu is described as the founder of the present empire and the ancestor of the present emperor, on the other he is described as the fourth son of Ukai Fukiazu no Mikoto, who was fifth in direct descent from the beautiful sun goddess Tensho Daijin. But as no such thing as writing existed in Japan in those days, or for many centuries afterward, it would not be surprising if a real monarch should have a mythical origin assigned to him. And as I have quite lately heard from the guns firing at Nagasaki, an imperial salute in honor of his coronation, and have seen the flags waving over the capital city, Tokyo, in honor of the birthday, the Emperor Jimu is quite historical enough for my present purpose. The commencement of his reign shall fix for us, as it does for others, the Japanese year one which was 660 years prior to our year one, so that any date of the Christian era can be converted into one of the Japanese era by the addition of 660 years, and vice versa. Some of the emperors will be found to have lived very long lives, no doubt, but as I have said elsewhere, none of them lived nearly so long as our Adam, Methuselah, and others, in whose longevity so many of us profess to believe. And besides, it is impossible for me to attempt to correct a chronology which Japanese scholars and Englishmen versed in the Japanese language have thus far left without specific correction. Deferring for after consideration the incidents of the successive imperial reigns, except insofar as they bear directly upon the descent of the crown, let us then first glance at the succession of emperors and empresses who have ruled in the morning land. After the death of Emperor Jimu, there appears to have been an interregnum for three years, although it is seldom taken account of. The second emperor, Suisei, who was the fifth son of the first emperor, having ascended to the throne B.C. 581 and reigned until 549. The cause of the interregnum appears to have been the extreme grief which Suisei felt at the death of his father, in consequence of which he committed the administration of the empire for a time to one of his relatives, an unworthy fellow, as he proved, named Tagishi Mimi no Mikoto, who tried to assassinate his master and seize the throne for himself, and who was put to death by Suisei for his pains. The fifth son of the Emperor Jimu was nominated by him as the successor, and it is probable that older sons were living and passed over, and that the throne was inherited in part by nomination even in this its first transfer. Some writers on Japanese history profess to see nothing in the pantheon of Japan pictured in the Kojiki and the Honki, nothing more than a collection of distinguished personages who lived and labored and contended in the country before the historic period, thus bringing deified men and women down to earth again. Such persons accept the records of Jimu Tenno's origin as essentially accurate insofar as they state what is human and reasonable, rejecting them only when they set forth what is supernatural and to them unbelievable. 
Others, on the contrary, consider or profess to consider the supernatural portions of those narratives as perfectly trustworthy, and discredit only those statements concerning the first of the sacred emperors which would seem in any way to detract from his divinity. I should be sorry to have to argue the case with either of these parties, but I must take the liberty of accepting as sufficiently accurate as much of the recorded lives of Jimo and his successors as the modern prosaic histories in Japan are content to put forth, and no more. Proceeding upon this basis, there is not much to be said of the reigns of the Mikados who ruled before the Christian era, beyond what has been already stated. As regards the first emperor, his ancestor, Ninigi no Mikoto, whether a god or not, or whether he came down from the sun by means of the bridge of heaven or not, appears to have been appears to have established his residence at the ancient Himuka, now Hyuga. There it was that Jimu Tenno first resided, and thence it was that he started on his historic and memorable career. The central parts of Japan were militarily occupied by rebels, whose names are preserved, and it was to subdue them that he proceeded eastward. He stopped for three years at Takashima, constructing the necessary vessels for crossing the waters, and then in the course of years making his way victoriously as far as Nanieva, the modern Osaka, encountered his foes at Kawachi, and defeated them, the chief general being left dead on the battlefield. Jimmu was now sole master of Japan, as then known, and in the following year he mounted the throne. The eastern and northern parts of the country were, however, still and long afterwards peopled by the Aino race, who were at a later period treated as troublesome savages, and conquered by the famous prince Yamato Dake by help of the sacred sword. The spot selected by the emperor Jimmu for his capital was Kashiwabara, in the province of Yamato, not far from the present western capital of Kyoto. He there did honor to the gods, married, built himself a palace, and deposited in the throne room the sacred mirror, sword, and ball, the insignia of the imperial power handed down from the sun goddess. He organized two imperial guards, one as a bodyguard to protect the interior of the palace, and the other to act as sentinels around the palace. Recording by Larry Wilson The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 1 Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd Prince Jimu founds Japan's capital, B.C. 660, by the Nehongi. The Emperor Kamiyamoto Iharebiko's personal name, Ikohoho Demi. He was the fourth child of Ikudagisi Takeugaya Ukiahezu no Mikoto. His mother's name was Tamayori Hime, daughter of the sea god. From his birth, this emperor was of clear intelligence and resolute will. At the age of 15, he was made heir to the throne. When he grew up, he married Ahira Tsuhimi of the district of Ata in the province of Iuga and made her his consort. By her, he had Takishi Mimi no Mikoto and Kisu Mimi no Mikoto. When he reached the age of 45, he addressed his elder brothers and his children, saying, Of old, our heavenly deities, Takami Musubi no Mikoto and Ohohirume no Mikoto, pointing to this land of fair rice ears of the fertile reed plain, Give it to our heavenly ancestor, Ikohono Ninigi no Mikoto. Thereupon, Ikohono Ninigi no Mikoto, throwing open the barrier of heaven and clearing a cloud path, urged on his superhuman course until he came to rest. At this time, the world was given over to widespread desolation. It was an age of darkness and disorder. In this gloom, therefore, he fostered justice and so governed this western border. Our imperial ancestors and imperial parent like gods, like sages, accumulated happiness and amassed glory. Many years elapsed from the date when our heavenly ancestor descended until now it is over 1,792,470 years. But the remote regions do not yet enjoy the blessings of imperial rule. Every town has always been allowed to have its lord and every village its chief, who each one for himself makes division of territory and practices mutual aggression and conflict. Now I have heard from the ancient of the sea, and in the east there is a fair land encircled on all sides by blue mountains. Moreover, there is there one who flew down riding in a heavenly rock boat. I think that this land will undoubtedly be suitable for an extension of the heavenly task, 
so that its glory should fill the universe. It is doubtless the center of the world. The person who flew down was, I believe, Nigihayehi. Why should we not proceed thither and make it the capital? All the imperial princes answered and said, The truth of this is manifest. This thought is constantly present to our minds also. Let us go thither quickly. This was the year Kinoye Tora, 51st of the great year, Kinoye Tora. In that year in winter, on the Kanoto Tori day, the 5th of the 10th month, the new moon of which was on the day Hinotomi, the emperor in person led the imperial princes and a naval force on an expedition against the east. When he arrived at Hayasui Gate, there was there a fisherman who came riding in a boat. The emperor summoned him, and then inquired of him, saying, Who art thou? He answered and said, Thy servant is a country god, and his name is Utsuhiko. I angle for fish in the bays of the ocean. Hearing that the son of the heavenly deity was coming, therefore I forthwith came to receive him. Again he inquired of him, saying, Canst thou act as my guide? He answered and said, I will do so. The emperor ordered the end of a pole of shihi wood to be given to the fisher, and caused him to be taken and pulled into the imperial vessel of which he was made pilot. A name was especially granted him, and he was called Shihinetsu Hiko. This was the first ancestor of the Yamoto no Atahe. Proceeding on their voyage, they arrived at Usa in the land of Tsukushi. At this time there appeared the ancestors of Kunitsuko of Usa, named Usa Tsuhiko and Usa Tsuhimi. They built a palace raised on one pillar on the banks of the river Usa, and offered them a banquet. Then, by imperial command, Usa Tsuhimi was given in marriage to the emperor's attendant minister, Amanotane no Mikoto. Now, Amanotane no Mikoto was the remote ancestor of Nakatomi Uji. Eleventh month, ninth day, the emperor arrived at the harbor of Oka in the land of Tsukushi. Twelfth month, twenty-seventh day, he arrived at the province of Aki, where he dwelt in the palace of Ye. The year Kinoto U, spring, third month, sixth day, going onward, he entered the land of Kibi and built a temporary palace in which he dwelt. It was called the Palace of Takashima. Three years passed, during which time he set in order the helms of his ships and prepared a store of provisions. It was his desire by single effort to subdue the empire. The year Tsuchi no Ye, Muma, spring, second month, eleventh day. The imperial forces at length proceeded eastward, the prow of one ship touching the stern of another. Just when they reached Cape Naniho, they encountered a current of great swiftness, whereupon that place was called Namahaya wave swift, or Namihana, wave flower. It is now called Naniha, which is a corruption of this. Third month, tenth day. Proceeding upwards against the stream, they went straight on and arrived at the port of Awokumo Nishiradate, in the township of Kusaka, in the province of Kafuchi. Summer, fourth month, ninth day. The imperial forces in martial array marched on to Tatsuta. The road was narrow and precipitous, and the men were unable to march abreast, so they returned and again endeavored to go eastward, crossing over Mount Ikoma. In this way, they entered the inner country. Now, when Nagasuni Hiko heard this, he said, The object of the children of the heavenly deity in coming hither is assuredly to rob me of my country. So he straightway levied all the forces under his dominion and intercepted them at the hill of Kusaka. A battle was engaged, and Itsu no Mikoto was hit by a random arrow on the elbow. The imperial forces were unable to advance against the enemy. The emperor was vexed and resolved in his inmost heart a divine plan, saying, I am the descendant of the sun goddess, and if I proceed against the sun to attack the enemy, I shall act contrary to the way of heaven. Better to retreat and make a show of weakness. Then, sacrificing to the gods of heaven and earth, and bringing on our backs the might of the sun goddess, let us follow her rays and trample them down. If we do so, the enemy will assuredly be routed of themselves, and we shall not stain our swords with blood. They all said, It is good. Thereupon he gave orders to the army, saying, Wait a while, and advance no further. 
So he withdrew his forces, and the enemy also did not dare to attack him. He then retired to the port of Kusaka, where he set up shields and made a warlike show. Therefore the name of this port was changed to Tatetsu, which is now corrupted to Tadetsu. Before this, at the Battle of Kusaka, there was a man who hid in a great tree, and by so doing escaped danger. So pointing to this tree, he said, I am grateful to it, as to my mother. Therefore the people of the day called the place Omonoki no Mura. Fifth month, eighth day. The army arrived at the port of Yamaki in Chinu, also called Port Yamanoi. Now Itsuse no Mikoto's arrow wound was extremely painful. He grasped his sword, and striking a martial attitude, said, How exasperating it is that a man should die of a wound received at the hands of slaves, and should not avenge it. The people of that day, therefore, called the place Ono Minoto. Proceeding onward, they reached Mount Kama in the land of Ki, where Itsuse no Mikoto died in the army, and was therefore buried at Mount Kama. Six month, twenty-third day. The army arrived at the village of Nagusa, where they put to death the Tohei of Nagusa. Finally, they crossed the moor of Sano and arrived at the village of Kami in Kumano. Here he embarked in the rock boat of heaven, and leading his army proceeded onward by slow degrees. In the midst of the sea, they suddenly met with a violent wind, and the imperial vessel was tossed about. Then Ina Ihi no Mikoto exclaimed and said, Alas, my ancestors were heavenly deities, and my mother was a goddess of the sea. Why do they harass me by land, and why, moreover, do they harass me by sea? When he had said this, he drew his sword and plunged into the sea, where he became changed into the god Sabimochi. Miki no no Mikoto, also indignant at this, said, My mother and my aunt are both sea goddesses. Why do they raise great billows to overwhelm us? So treading upon the waves, he went to the eternal land. The emperor was now alone with the imperial prince, Tagishimimi no Mikoto. Leading his army forward, he arrived at Port Arasaka in Kumano, also called Nishiki Bay, where he put to death the Tohei of Nishiki. At this time, the gods belched up a poisonous vapor from which everyone suffered. For this reason, the imperial army was again unable to exert itself. Then there was there a man by name Kumano no Takakuraji, who unexpectedly had a dream, in which Amaterasu no Ohokami spoke to Takemika Tsuchi no Kami, saying, I still hear a sound of disturbance from the central land of reed plains. Do thou again go and chastise it? Takemika Tsuchi no Kami answered and said, Even if I go not, I can send down my sword with which I subdued the land, upon which the country will of its own accord become peaceful. To this Amaterasu no Kami assented. Thereupon Takemiki Tsuchi no Kami addressed Takakuraji, saying, My sword, which is called Futsu no Mitama, I will now place in the storehouse. Do thou take it and present it to the heavenly grandchild, Takakuraji said. Yes, and thereupon awoke. The next morning, as instructed in his dream, he opened the storehouse, and on looking in, there was indeed there a sword which had fallen down from heaven and was standing upside down on the plank floor of the storehouse. So he took it and offered it to the emperor. At this time the emperor happened to be asleep. He awoke suddenly and said, Oh, what a long time I have slept. On inquiry, he found that the troops who had been affected by the poison had all recovered their senses and were afoot. The emperor then endeavored to advance into the interior, but among the mountains it was so precipitous that there was no road by which they could travel, and they wandered about not knowing whither to direct their march. Then Amaterasu no Ohokami instructed the emperor in a dream of the night, saying, I will now send the Yatakarasu, make it thy guide through the land. Then there did indeed appear the Yatakarasu flying down from the void. The emperor said, the coming of this crow is in due accordance with my auspicious dream. How grand, how splendid! My imperial ancestor, Amaterasu no Ohokami, deserves therewith to assist me in creating the hereditary institution. At this time, Hino Omi no Mikoto, ancestor of the Ohotomo house, 
taking with him Ohokume as commander of the main body, guided by the direction taken by the crow, looked up to it and followed after until at length they arrived at the district of Lower Uda. Therefore they named the place which they reached the village of Ukichi no Uda. At this time, by an imperial order, he commended Hino Omi no Mikoto, saying, Thou art faithful and brave, and art moreover a successful guide. Therefore will I give thee a new name, and will call thee Michi no Omi. Autumn, eighth month, second day. The emperor said to summon Ukeshi, the elder, and Ukeshi, the younger. These two were chiefs of the district of Uda. Now Ukeshi, the elder, did not come, but Ukeshi, the younger, came, and making obeisance at the gate of the camp, declared as follows. Thy servant's elder brother, Ukeshi, the elder shows signs of resistance. Hearing that the descendant of heaven was about to arrive, he forthwith raised an army with which to make an attack. But having seen from afar the might of the imperial army, he was afraid, and did not dare to oppose it. Therefore he has secretly placed his troops in ambush, and has built for the occasion a new palace in the hall of which he has prepared engines. It is his intention to invite the emperor to a banquet there, and then to do him a mischief. I pray that this treachery be noted, and that good care be taken to make preparations against it. The emperor straightway sent Michi no Omi no Mikoto to observe the signs of his opposition. Michi no Omi no Mikoto clearly ascertained his hostile intentions, and being greatly enraged, shouted at him in a blustering manner, Wretch! Thou shalt thyself dwell in the house which thou hast made. So, grasping his sword and drawing his bow, he urged him and drove him within it. Ukeshi, the elder, being guilty before heaven, and the matter not admitting of excuse of his own accord, trod upon the engine and was crushed to death. His body was then brought out and decapitated, and the blood which flowed from it reached above the ankle. Therefore that place was called Udan no Chibahara. After this, Ukeshi the younger prepared a great feast of beef and sake with which he entertained the imperial army. The emperor distributed this flesh and sake to the common soldiers, upon which they sang the following verses. In the high castle tree of Uda, I set a snare for woodcock and waited, but no woodcock came to it. A valiant whale came to it. This is called a kume song. In the present time, when the Department of Music performs this song, there is still the measurement of great and small by the hand as well as a distinction of coarse and fine in the notes of the voice. This is by a rule handed down from antiquity. After this, the emperor wished to respect the land of Hoyoshino, so taking personal command of the light troops, he made a progress round by the way of Ukechimura in Uda. When he came to Yoshino, there was a man who came out of a well. He shone and had a tail. The emperor inquired of him, saying, What man art thou? He answered and said, Thy servant is a local deity, and his name is Wihikari. He it is who was the first ancestor of Yoshino no Obito. Proceeding a little further, there was another man with a tail who burst open a rock and came forth from it. The emperor inquired of him, saying, What man art thou? He answered and said, Thy servant is the child of Iha Oshiwake. It was he who was the first ancestor of Kuzu of Yoshino. Then, skirting the river, he proceeded westward, when there appeared another man who had made a fish trap and was catching fish. On the emperor making inquiry of him, he answered and said, Thy servant is the son of Nihimotsu. He it is who was the first ancestor of Hukahi Ata. Ninth month, fifth day. The emperor ascended to the peak of Mount Takakura in Uda, whence he had a prospect over all the land. On Kunimi Hill there were described eighty bandits. Moreover, at the acclivity of the Meisaka, there was posted an army of women, and at the acclivity of Osaka there was stationed a force of men. At the acclivity of Sumisaka there was placed burning charcoal. This was the origin of the names Meisaka, Wosaka, and Sumisaka. Again, there was the army of Yeshiki, which covered all the village of Ihare. All the places occupied by the enemy were strong positions, and therefore the roads were cut off and obstructed, 
so that there was no room for passage. The emperor, indignant at this, made prayer on that night in person, and then fell asleep. The heavenly deity appeared to him in a dream, and instructed him, saying, Take earth from within the shrine of the heavenly Mount Kagu, and of it make eighty heavenly platters. Also make sacred jars, and therewith sacrifice to the gods of heaven and earth. Moreover, pronounce a solemn imprecation. If thou doest so, the enemy will render submission of their own accord. The emperor received with reverence the directions given in his dream, and proceeded to carry them into execution. Now Ukeshi the younger again addressed the emperor, saying, There are, in the province of Yamoto, in the village of Shiki, eighty Shiki bandits. Moreover, in the village of Takawahari, some say Katsuraki, there are eighty Agane bandits. All these tribes intend to give battle to the emperor and thy servant is anxious in his own mind on his account. It were now good to take clay from the heavenly Mount Kagu, and therewith to make heavenly platters with which to sacrifice to the gods of the heavenly shrines and of the earthly shrines. If after doing so thou dost attack the enemy, they may be easily driven off. The emperor, who had already taken the words of his dream for a good omen, when he now heard the words of Ukeshi the younger, was still more pleased in his heart. He caused Shihi Netsuhiko to put on ragged garments and a grass hat and to disguise himself as an old man. He also caused Ukeshi the younger to cover himself with a winnowing tray so as to assume the appearance of an old woman and then addressed them saying, Do ye too proceed to the heavenly mount Kagu and secretly take earth from its summit. Having done so, return hither. By means of you, I shall then divine whether my undertaking will be successful or not. Do your utmost to be watchful. Now the enemy's army filled the road, and made all passage impossible. Then Shihi Natsuhiko prayed, and said, If it be possible for our emperor to conquer this land, let the road by which we must travel become open. But if not, let the brigands surely oppose our passage. Having thus spoken, they set forth and went straight onward. Now the hostile band, seeing the two men, laughed loudly and said, What an uncouth old man and old woman! So with one accord they left the road and allowed the two men to pass and proceed to the mountain, where they took the clay and returned with it. Hereupon the emperor was greatly pleased, and with this clay he made eighty platters, eighty heavenly small jars and sacred jars, with which he went to the upper waters of the river Nifu and sacrificed to the gods of heaven and earth. Immediately on the Asahara plain by the river of Uda, it became, as it were, like foam on the water, the result of the curse cleaving to them. Moreover, the emperor went on to utter a vow, saying, I will now make Ame in the eighty platters without using water. If the Ame is formed, Then shall I assuredly, without effort and without recourse to the might of arms, reduce the empire to peace. So he made Ame, which forthwith became formed of itself. Again he made a vow, saying, I will now take the sacred jars and sink them in the river Nifu. If the fishes, whether great or small, become every one drunken and are carried down the stream like as it were to floating maki leaves, Then shall I assuredly succeed in establishing this land. But if this be not so, there will never be any results. Thereupon he sank the jars in the river with their mouths downward. After a while the fish all came to the surface, gaping, gasping as they floated down the stream. Then Shihi Netsuhiko, seeing this, represented it to the emperor, who was greatly rejoiced and plucking up a five-hundred-branched masakaki tree of the upper waters of the river Nifu, he did worship wherewith to all the gods. It was with this that the custom began of selling sacred jars. At this time he commanded Michi no Omi no Mikoto, saying, We are now in person about to celebrate a public festival to Takami Musubi no Mikoto, and I appoint thee ruler of the festival, and I grant thee the title of Itsuhimi, the earthen jars which are set up shall be called Izube, or sacred jars. The fire shall be called Izu no Kagu Tsuchi, or sacred fire elder. The water shall be called Izu no Mizuha, Nome, or sacred water female. 
The food shall be called Utsuka Nome, or Sacred Food Female. The firewood shall be called Izuno Yamatsuchi, or Sacred Mountain Elder. And the grass shall be called Izuno no Tsuchi, or Sacred Moor Elder. Winter, tenth month, first day. The emperor tasted the food of Izube, and arraying his troops set forth upon his march. He first of all attacked the eighty bandits of Mount Kunimi, routed and slew them. It was in this campaign that the emperor, fully resolved on victory, made these verses saying, Like the Shitadami, which creep round the great rock of sea and isle. Like Shitadami, which creep around the great rock of the sea of Ise, where blows the divine wind, like the Shitadami. My boys, my boys, we will creep around, and smite them utterly, and smite them utterly. In this poem, by the great rock is intended the hill of Kunimi. After this, the band which remained was still numerous, and their disposition could not be fathomed. So the emperor privately commanded Michino Omi no Mikoto, saying, Do thou take with thee the Oho Kume, and make a great muro at the village of Osaka. Prepare a copious banquet, invite the enemy to it, and then capture them. Michino Omi no Mikoto, thereupon, in obedience to the emperor's sacred behest, dug a muro at Osaka and having selected his bravest soldiers, stayed therein, mingled with the enemy. He secretly arranged with them, saying, When they have got tipsy with sake, I will strike up a song. Do you, when you hear the sound of my song, all at the same time stab the enemy? Having made this arrangement, they took their seats, and the drinking bout proceeded. The enemy, unaware that there was any plot, abandoned themselves to their feelings, and promptly became intoxicated. Then Michi no Omi no Mikoto struck up the following song. At Osaka in the great Muro house, though men in plenty enter and stay, we the glorious sons of warriors, wielding our mallet heads, wielding our stone mallets, will smite them utterly. Now when our troops heard this song, they all drew at the same time their mallet-headed swords, and simultaneously slew the enemy, so that there were no eaters left. The imperial army was greatly delighted. They looked up to heaven and laughed. Therefore he made a song, saying, Though folk say that one ye mishi is a match for a hundred men, they do not so much as resist. The practice according to which at present time the kume sings this and then laugh aloud had this origin. Again he sang, saying, Ho, now is the time. Ho, now is the time. Ha, ha, psha. Even now, my boys, even now, my boys. All these songs were sung in accordance with the secret behest of the emperor. He had not presumed to compose them with his own motion. Then the emperor said, It is the part of a good general, when victorious, to avoid arrogance. The chief brigands have now been destroyed, but there are ten bands of villains of a similar stamp who are disputatious. Their disposition cannot be ascertained. Why should we remain for a long time in one place? By so doing, we could not have control over emergencies. So he removed his camp to another place. Eleventh month, seventh day. The imperial army proceeded in great force to attack the Hiko of Shiki. First of all, the emperor sent a messenger to summon Shiki the elder, but he refused to obey. Again, the Yatagarasu was sent to bring him. When the crow reached his camp, it cried to him, saying, The child of the heavenly day descends for thee. Haste, haste. Shiki, the elder, was enraged at this and said, Just when I heard that the conquering deity of heaven was coming, I was indignant at this. Why shouldst thou, a bird of the crow tribe, utter such an abominable cry? So he drew his bow and aimed at it. The crow forthwith fled away, and next proceeded to the house of Shiki the younger, where it cried, saying, The child of the heavenly deity summons thee. Haste, haste. Then Shiki the younger was afraid, and changing countenance said, oh, Thy servant, hearing of the approach of the conquering deity of heaven, is full of dread, morning and evening. Well hast thou cried to me, O crow. He straightway made eight leaf platters on which he disposed food, and entertained the crow. 
Accordingly, in obedience to the crow, he proceeded to the emperor and informed him, saying, My elder brother, Shiki the elder, hearing of the approach of the child of the heavenly deity, forthwith assembled eighty bandits and provided arms with which he is about to do battle with thee. It will be well to take measures against him without delay. The emperor accordingly assembled his generals and inquired of them, saying, It appears that Shiki the elder has now rebellious intentions. I summoned him, but again he will not come. What is to be done? The general said, Shiki the elder is a crafty knave. It will be well, first of all, to send Shiki the younger to make matters clear to him, and at the same time to make explanations to Kuraji the elder and Kuraji the younger. If after that they still refuse submission, it will not be too late to take warlike measures against them. Shiki the younger was accordingly sent to explain to them their interests, that Shiki the elder and the others adhered to their foolish design and would not consent to submit. Then Shiki Netsuhiko advised as follows, Let us uh, first send out our feebler troops by the Osaka road. When the enemy sees them, he will assuredly proceed thither with all his best troops. We should then straightway urge forward our robust troops and make straight for the Sumizaka. Then, with the water of the river Uda, we should sprinkle the burning charcoal and suddenly take them unawares, when they cannot fail to be routed. The emperor approved this plan and sent out the feebler troops towards the enemy, who, thinking that a powerful force was approaching, awaited them with all their power. Now up to this time, whenever the imperial army attacked, they invariably captured, and when they fought, they were invariably victorious, so that the fighting men were all wearied out. Therefore the emperor, to comfort the hearts of his leaders and men, struck off this verse. As we fight, going forth and watching, from between the trees, about Inasa we are famished, ye keepers of comrades, birds of the island. Come now to our aid. In the end, he crossed Sumizaka with the stronger troops, and going round by the rear, attacked them from two sides and put them to the rout, killing their chieftains, Shiki the Elder, and the others. Third month, seventh day. The emperor made an order, saying, During the six years that our expedition against the east has lasted, owing to my reliance on the majesty of imperial heaven, the wicked bands have met death. It is true that the frontier lands are still unpurified, and that a remnant of evil is still refractory. But in the region of the central land there is no more wind and dust. Truly we should make a vast and spacious capital, and plan it great and strong. At present things are in a crude and obscure condition, and the people's minds are unsophisticated. They roost in nests or dwell in caves. Their manners are simply what is customary. Now, if a great man were to establish laws, justice could not fail to flourish. And even if some gain should accrue to the people, in what way would this interfere with the sage's action? Moreover, it will be well to open up and clear the mountains and forests, and to construct a palace. Then I may reverently assume the precious dignity, and so give peace to my good subjects. Above, I should then respond to the kindness of the heavenly powers in granting me the kingdom, and below I should extend the line of imperial descendants and foster right-mindedness. Thereafter the capital may be extended so as to embrace all the six cardinal points, and the eight cords may be covered so as to form a roof. Will this not be well? When I observe the Kashiha Bara plain, which lies southwest of Mount Unebi, it seems the center of the land. I must set it in order. Accordingly, he and this month commanded officers to set about the construction of an imperial residence. Year Kanoye Saru, Autumn, Eighth Month, Sixteenth Day The emperor, intending to appoint a wife, sought afresh children of noble families. Now there was a man who made representation to him, saying, There is a child who was born to Kotoshiro Nushi no Kami by his union with Tamakushi Hime, daughter of Mizohuhi ni no Kami of Mishima. Her name is Hime Tatara Itsuzu Hime no Mikoto. She is a woman of remarkable beauty. The emperor was rejoiced, and on the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, 
he received Himitatara Isuzu Himi no Mikoto and made her his wife. Year Kanoto Tori, spring, first month, first day. The emperor assumed the imperial dignity in the palace of Kashiharabara. This year is reckoned the first year of his reign. He honored his wife by making her empress. The children born to him by her were Kamiyawi Mimi no Mikoto and Kami Nuna Gaha Mimi no Mikoto. Therefore, there is an ancient saying in praise of this as follows. In Kashihabara Inunebi, he mightily established his palace pillars on the foundation of the bottom rock and reared aloft the cross-roof timbers of the plain of high heaven. The name of the emperor who thus began to rule the empire was Kamiyamoto Ihare Biko Ohodemi. Fourth year, spring, second month, twenty-third day. The emperor issued the following decree. The spirits of our imperial ancestors, reflecting their radiance down from heaven, illuminate and assist us. All our enemies have now been subdued, and there is peace within the seas. We ought to take advantage of this to perform sacrifice to the heavenly deities and therewith develop filial duty. He accordingly established spirit terraces among the Tomi Hills, which were called Kamitsu Wono Kakihara and Shimotsu Wono no Kakihara. There he worshipped his imperial ancestors, the heavenly deities. Seventy-sixth year, spring, third month, eleventh day. The emperor died in the palace of Kashihabara. His age was then one hundred twenty-seven. The following year, autumn, the twelfth day of the ninth month, he was buried in the Misasigi, northeast of Mount Unebi. End of section 17